10th grader. And our teacher, we had a phenomenal teacher. He was always bringing in these controversial type people to address the class and we could ask questions and stuff. Well, on this day, he had the head of the American Nazi Party come to our school. Now, understand, you, you would never even, you, you couldn't even wrap your head around that today, okay? But it's 1970s. Things were different. Jesus. Yeah. Okay, now, the founder and the original head of the American Nazi Party was a fellow named George Lincoln Rockwell. And, it, and just by coincidence, I had his daughter as one of my teachers a long time ago. And, but, you know, she, she renounced her father. She wanted nothing to do with him. You know, she didn't even, even let you know that that was her dad, but it was. What would the head of the American Nazi Society say to a group of 10th graders? I'm going to tell you. Well, mostly seniors. But uh, uh, George Lincoln Rockwell, uh, he, he was the founder and the original head vehement uh, anti-Semite uh, and uh, racist. He was always getting into it with uh, Martin Luther King. And um, he was murdered by one of his own Nazis. They got into an argument on the sidewalk outside his headquarters, and the guy shot him to death right there on the sidewalk. So anyway, his right-hand guy was a guy named Matt Cole, K-O-E-H-L. And Matt Cole and his right-hand guy took over, Martin Kerr. So they came to my school that day. And... Um, you know, they're espousing all these views of white supremacy. And I'm just sitting there listening to him. And I'd never heard an adult talk like this before. And there was another black guy in the class. I mean, there were more blacks in the school, but just two of us in this particular class. And Matt Cole pointed at me and pointed at my friend. And he said, we're going to ship you back to Africa. And then he went like this. And all you Jews out there, you're going back to Israel. Now, I just sat there. Staring at this guy. He wasn't scaring me, but I was like thinking, who gives this guy the right to, to make you know, these, these arrangements for me, you know? And um, I, I, I didn't challenge him because you've you, you got to understand, my generation, we were raised to have respect for your elders. Anybody who's older than you is your elder, mm. whether it's the postman, the policeman, your neighbor, the librarian, whatever. If they're older than you, they're your elder, you respect them. You don't have to accept what they say, but you respect them. So I didn't, I, I didn't challenge him. I just sat there looking at him. And somebody piped up in my class and said, what happens if they don't go or if they don't want to go? And Matt Cole says they have no choice. If they do not leave voluntarily, they will be exterminated in the upcoming race war. Now, that was the first time I ever heard the term race war. I've heard it a thousand times since then. But that was the first time I ever heard it. I'm thinking to myself, what is this man talking about? Civil War? I mean, that was over 1865, you know? Hmm. And um, he went on to say that uh, your uniform, uh, the color of your skin will be your uniform. Jesus. Yeah. So then later that day, I was standing beside my locker, and uh, Matt Cole and Martin Kerr were leaving the school. They, you know, they'd hung around for a couple other POTC classes. So they come down the hallway, and I'm standing there. And it's just me and those two in the Nazis in the hallway. Right. And they didn't say anything to me, but they paused right in front of me and like sneered at me, leered at me, and then they started laughing and they went on past me and on out the door, right? So I graduated two years later as a senior and I went to Howard University and got my degree in music. You know, music became my profession, but studying race relations on my own became my obsession. And these two guys had propelled me into that to really, you know, dig into it a lot more. What was that feeling like, being so young and being, um, like, treated like that by two grown-ass adults? Like, It was weird to see them talk like that. And, and they were, like, you know, vehement about it. Right. You know what I mean? They were into this belief. Um, I just didn't understand it. And so I even bought more books. I, I continue to buy books. So I got this vast library on white supremacy, on you know, black supremacy, all kinds of stuff. And I read them all, but none of the books addressed why people became like that. So um, I graduated four years later with my degree in music, bachelor's degree in music. And uh, but, you know, I was always you know, tuning in to all kinds of racial stuff, right? So I found out about an unpublicized demonstration rally that the American Nazi Party was going to have. See, their headquarters was right near me over in Arlington, Virginia. Arlington, Virginia is about... 35, 40 minutes from where I live in Maryland. Okay. Just on, just on the other side of, of the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. Okay. Okay. 
they're going to have an unpublicized rally in front of the White House across the street in Lafayette Park. So if you know anything about Lafayette Park, anytime you want to protest something, you go to Lafayette Park. There are people there 24-7. They've been there for years. The people, uh, anti-nuke people, the environmental people, uh, anti-abortion people, you name it, they're there. And they're set up in the park facing the White House. So whoever is in the Oval Office for whatever term can look out the window and read their billboards and whatever. Right. Right. Okay. So unpublicized means nobody knows about it except who they tell. I managed to find out. How'd you find out? Somebody let me know. Okay. Okay. And so uh, it was going to be a 12 noon, like a 15-minute a uh, silent uh, protest in front of the White House. So now back then you could drive your car up and down the 1600 block of Pennsylvania Avenue, which is where the White House is located. Today you can't do that anymore. Only uh, uh, law enforcement vehicles and uh, pedestrians, you know, you can walk up and down there, but you mm. can't drive because hmm. people have tried to ram the gates of the White House, mm. right? So they, so they put up concrete pylons and stuff, you know, that, that fold down into the street with, with a remote control so cop cars can come through there. So anyway, uh, back then, you, you know, you could drive there. So I went down there. I parked my car caddy corner to the White House, and I waited. And sure enough, right up, you know, just, just before noon, this van comes, and about 13, 15 of these guys get out. Now, this is eight years later, 1982. Okay, I saw them in, in 1974. All right? So um, they get out. There's Matt Cole and Martin Kerr, the same two dudes, you know, because they're still the head of the party. Right. Right? Um, so they're lining up their little Nazis on, on the sidewalk. Now, there's nothing that, uh, that indicated that they were Nazis. You wouldn't know it unless, unless you knew in advance, right? They didn't wear Gestapo uniforms or fly swastikas. They're all in dark black suits, and they're standing there like this, facing the White House, right? It's noontime, so it's lunchtime. People are, like, walking back and forth, you know, not paying any attention because there, there are other protesters in the park too. So, but nobody knew who these people were. They just stand there facing the White House. The White House knew who they were. So anyway, I went for them to get all lined up. I got out of my car. I felt the need to confront Matt Cole because when I was 15, I did not confront him. And like I told you, I was a child. He was an adult. You know, he was my elder. Mm-hmm. So now I needed to confront him. Um, he was still my elder, obviously. Okay, but the dynamic had changed. In 1974, it was child to adult. Now it's adult to adult. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I felt the need to confront him. So I walked right up to him. I said, Matt Cole. And he, some, he like jumped back in the line. Like, oh my God, who, who's this black person, you know, calling my name? And um, he says, do I know you? And I said, well, you spoke at my high school. And he said, and what high school would that be? I said, Thomas Wooten High School. He looked at me, he goes, Oh, yes, yes, yes. I remember you. That was a long time ago. What can I do for you? I said, yes, it was eight years ago. He goes, I remember. How, how can I help you? I said, do you recall what you told me? He nodded. He goes, yes. What can I do for you? I said, well, I'm still here. He said, well, I can see that. How can I help you? I said, well, you can tell me just who the hell gives you the authority to make permanent travel arrangements for me. He says, well, what's your name? I said, Daryl Davis. He put his hand out. He shook my hand. I learned this technique because I, I would apply it later on to another white supremacist. He, he took my hand, and he held my hand in his hand, and he, he did not let it go. And he, and he started pointing in my face with his other hand like this. And he says, Mr. Davis, you have to understand one thing. It is in the interest of your race, the black race, to be a strong race. And you cannot be a strong race unless you are a pure race. And you cannot be a pure race if you are miscegenating with other races. He went on and on about that. Then he says, it's in my interest, the Aryan race, which is what he calls the white race, Mm -hmm. to also be a strong race. And we must be a pure race. We are committing genocide by miscegenating with with mud races such as yours. We are becoming a mongrel race. So he calls anybody who's non-Aryan or non-white a mud race, mm. and then that that uh, that miscegenation causes them to be a mongrel race. So he says the white race is committing genocide by miscegenating with mud races, turning them into a mongrel race. Okay. So uh, so until the races understand uh, that they must remain separate, they cannot coexist together. So he, you know, he's going on on into this stuff, you know, that I would hear a thousand times over the years. And you were like 
23, early 20s? Uh, yeah, I just graduated, well, uh, 24, because I graduated in 1980 okay. at the age of 22. Okay, so it's in 1982. So, um, now, was that, the, was that the gist of the conversation you had with yeah, him? Or yeah, or and, like? and, you know, a few other things. And he, he went back to the race war thing. It's called Rahoa, R-A-H-O-W-A, Rahoa, which stands for Racial Holy War, Rahoa. And uh, that's the white supremacist term for the race war. And, and they've added a new term now, the boogaloo. Same thing, boogaloo or rahoa means the race war. Okay. So anyway, uh, we talked about that. And, you know, I thanked him for his time. Oh, and I wasn't there to beat him up. Yeah. You have a great voice. I want to make sure they can hear it. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't there to beat him up. You know, I was just there to yeah. try to, you know, understand. I'm trying to learn from this guy. I'm not buying into it. I'm just trying to learn where this comes from. So uh, I thanked him, shook his hand again. I uh, left. Well, a few months later, they had a publicized rally. They publicized it like about three months in advance. This is going to be the American Nazi Party recruitment rally, the national recruitment rally. So they have Nazis from all over the country come and gather, right, to recruit. Do now, they have like swastikas? Like, oh, yeah. They, now really? they have the swastikas, Jesus. okay? Because the first one was unpublicized. There were no police there or anything like that. Had it been publicized, protesters would have come and beat mm -hmm. the crap out of them. Mm -hmm. All right? So this one was publicized. Even months in advance, people were, like, writing letters to, to uh, the D.C. mayor, and, you know, don't give them a permit, blah, 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 on and on and on. But, you know, you have to give them a permit. You know, they have the right to freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and all that kind of thing, just like anybody else does. So they come this time, they got police protection because there were probably about 50 of them. My secretary and I went down there. To this thing you couldn't get close to them the police had formed a human ring circle around them all right and with their shields and their batons like this there were no less than about ten thousand, ten thousand protesters for these like maybe 50 nazis and matt cole comes with martin kerr and they, they all are now wearing their gestapo uniforms flying swastikas going zig heil high hitler white power you know they're taunting the uh, the crowd so people came with bricks and baseball bats and chains, and they rushed the police, and the police were, like, pushing them back. So then they began taking their projectiles and throwing them over the heads of the police to land on one of the Nazis, you know, in the circle. Right. And so the police pulled up the tear gas, began tear gassing everybody, and it became mayhem. My secretary and I were just standing there, and the police beat us with their nightsticks. Just for standing there, it became hysterical. I mean, it got out of control. I said, come on, let's get out of here. So we left. And uh, <clears throat> back then, you only had uh, NBC, CBS, and ABC. There was no cable. And um, we are watching the news. Now, people were, like, turning over police cars, bashing out the windows, kicking out the lights, setting buildings on fire, the whole nine yards. So we're watching the, uh, our local uh, NBC affiliate for, um, for the news. And uh, there's Matt Cole in the studio. Yeah, and he's saying, and, and they're showing footage of, of all the mayhem. You know, we even saw ourselves walking by. And he goes, you see, you see, it's the blacks and the Jews who, who are denying us our right to freedom of assembly, denying us our right to freedom of speech. You don't see any Nazis turning over police cars and setting fires. It's the blacks and the Jews. This country is run by ZOG, Z-O-G, ZOG. What does that stand for? It's an acronym for Zionist Occupied Government. That's their big word. All right, so it means everything is run by the Jews. So, so they blame the Jews for everything, and black people are the pawns of the Jews because black people are not as smart as the Jews in, the, in their minds. You know, we're dangerous, but we're not as smart as the, as the Jews, so they're more dangerous, so they call it Zog. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, um, I'm listening to him, and I realize this guy is pretty smart. He's shrewd, but he's smart. Because I couldn't figure out why on earth would he have his national recruitment rally in Washington, D.C. Washington, you know, Washington, D.C. is two-thirds black. The nickname for Washington, D.C. is Chocolate City. Okay? Washington, D.C. is two-thirds black. There are no black people in D.C. that want to be recruited into the, na into the Nazi party. You want publicity? Huh? Just well, I'll tell you, and, and certainly, there, you know, there are no Jews in D.C. or anywhere else right. that want to join the American Nazi Party. So why would he do it there? I got it. Because he knew this would happen. 
He knew this would happen, and it, and it would further his cause. He would have official news footage mm. of blacks and Jews wreaking havoc, turning over police cars, bashing out stuff, destroying the city. He would take that NBC, CBS, ABC news footage, go out to the to the Pacific Northwest, Idaho, Montana, you know, those in Washington State, Oregon, right. And said, look, you see what's going on in our nation's capital? The blacks and the Jews are taking over. Zog is taking over our country. Come join us. We're going to take our country back. And that works. They see that and, and they come and join. It's a recruitment tool. Mm. All right? Because, you know, if nobody rioted, it, it wouldn't do any good. Right. Okay, so. That brought the news cameras out. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, so that was that.